name is Margaret Bradkin, and I have a long history with dedicated funds for kids, having uh, led the campaign to start the first one in California in 1991 in San Francisco and have been involved in every one since, and then started this effort about eight years ago to help people around the state um, figure out how to make this happen. So um, I we have a very wide range of people here, from people who actually have already tried to do a measure <laughs> to people who are just getting started. So I'm going to share my screen for a minute. And I am going to ask for the indulgence of the people who have heard from me a lot. Um, I'm going to try to limit the amount of things that I repeat that you already know, but for the sake of um, a lot of people on the line, particularly young people and organizers, um, I will um, I'll do some repeated, re repetition of what people already know. So this is the agenda. What's the purpose of the meeting? What's a dedicated fund? What happened in Sacramento, our most recent uh, victory? Um, introducing some of the places here that are considering a measure, and I think I will just call on you. Um, and then some of the basics about ballot measures and then introducing our team of just fabulous consultants and experts. And then I hope to do all that in um, a very short period of time. So um, the first thing I wanna say is what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a network of support for people who are doing local ballot measures for kids. I mean, our hope is to spawn a statewide movement about it and you know, national movements. Some of the people on the line are our colleagues in the Children's Funding Project, which is a national organization attempting to do the same thing outside California. We are the California people. So what exactly does that mean? We have a team of experts who can help you in, we'll do some group teaching, some coaching, some consulting. It's what you need and what you request is how we're setting this thing up. So there will be trainings, there will be coaching and um, this meeting will be followed by uh, calls and a survey to you to say, okay, what do you want? What do you need to know about? And we'll plan an agenda for this group, you know, what you need individually, what you need, uh, what we need as a group. There'll be a national conference in the fall of 2023 that you will be invited to. Um, to meet the people around the country who are doing this. There'll be a statewide conference. There's opportunities for peer support. And of course, we are developing and sharing the best practices. So what's a local dedicated fund? Um, it's, uh, it's money dedicated at the local level to, um, for a specific purpose because how we spend our money reflects our values. Children are in need. This is a major uh, social justice issue. Um, and I, it, my colleague in the Children's Funding Project always says, what gets funded gets done. So that's, uh, I am a freak about, give me the money, show us where the money is. So here are some of the benefits of a local dedicated fund. You know, you can fill any kind of gap that's not addressed by other funding streams. It allows you to focus on prevention. It allows you to be innovative and coordinate things at the local level. It facilitates accountability. It generates public support because it happens at the local level and people see outcomes and it leverages other money and leads to more money. I call it magic money because it is so flexible. So what are the kinds of things you can fund if you put a measure on the ballot and create a local dedicated fund, a children's fund, a youth fund, a children and youth fund, a social justice uh, uh, fund? These are the kinds of things that are being funded around the state with these measures. And I won't read this list to you, but, you know, in early care, it's it's slots, it's vouchers, it's wages, it's all the things we need in early care and youth development. It's alternatives to incarceration, after school, youth leadership, um, all kinds of service, youth development services, uh, youth wellness centers. In San Francisco, we've been able to put a youth wellness center in every school with our 
um, Children and Youth Fund Family Support Services. So that just gives you a flavor for what you can fund. So these are the funds that exist in California. It's not a large number of funds. So everybody on this call is a pioneer. And you can see that they're clustered in Northern California. So welcome to everybody from Central California and South, 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 South California, um, Southern California. Uh, you are a part of creating something new. And I did want you to see a map that's um, made by our friends, uh, the, our national friends, to see how this is sort of laying out around the country, places where there are clusters of children and youth funds. And you can see they're clustered in key, key places. So what I want to do now, I'm gonna stop sharing and introduce you to Claudia Hassin, who is, um, who's been, well, who worked on the Children's Fund in San Francisco, has been a CBO leader, and for the last, I can't remember how many years, six, seven, um, she has been a leading light in Sacramento and a major policy person to the leader of the sort of youth movement um, on the Sacramento City Council. And it's been part of every every med every campaign in Sacramento. So Claudia has a few minutes to kind of tell us of the most recent success that we've had in California in order to uh, get a, a Children and Youth Fund. Claudia. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Margaret has asked me to tell the Sacramento story, which is a six-year story in five minutes. I'm just going to say that's not going to happen. We have to do a separate story time for that. Um, but what I do want to do is start with uh, great news. Uh, as you heard, it passed. Our Children's Fund passed with a 62.77% um, voters in favor. And I want to describe briefly what, what the actual ballot measure does to create the fund. It is a set aside of our general fund. So the tactic there, of course, was that we wanted to do a 50 plus one um, vote versus a two thirds vote. So we went for a set aside. However, we used our cannabis revenue, our business operating tax, as what I call the measuring stick. So the language says that the amount that will be set aside in our general fund is equivalent to 40% of the cannabis business operating tax revenue. Um, I can talk to you more separately about why we did that, um, but it's worked. More importantly, it worked. Uh, there's no sunset in our ballot measure either. And of course, like most of the other cities, we do have an oversight commission. So those are the main parts of our um, children's fund. Now, this is not a good news, bad news conversation. This is a great news, good news conversation. So the great news was that it passed. The good news is that it took three times to going to the ballot to pass it. And the good news with that for all of you is it's not going to take you three times. The reason it took us three uh -huh. times is each time there were really unique circumstances that led to the defeat of the ballot measure. So I don't want anyone to walk away from the Sacramento story thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to take us 10 times to go to the ballot. That's not true because we keep having great lessons learned throughout each iteration of these ballot measures across California, across the nation. Um, so what I wanna do is share a few of those lessons that will help tell some of our story. Um, so first of all, I wanna say across the six years that it took, so we started in 2016, June ballot, uh, we did a special tax as of the cannabis revenue. It was a two thirds vote and we lost by less than 1%. The second time was uh, in March of 2020. We did a just a straight up set aside of the general fund, and that one lost um, pretty badly. Less than 50% said yes. And then, of course, what we did in November. However, during that time, and this is another story time for us to have, is that I worked closely with the council member, um, Jay Chenier is his name, and we did a variety of other um, actions to try to make Sa Sacramento as a whole more child and youth friendly. And most of our work 
landed in kind of three buckets that we like to say. So one bucket was we worked on changing a lot of policies along the way. We weren't just waiting for the next election. We continuously worked to change things. So for example, in 2017, right after we lost that first time, we pulled together community folks and elected officials and created a citywide youth development plan that was adopted by council that kind of sets the tone and the direction for all the work that our city is supposed to be doing around children and youth. We also did some infrastructure, what I call infrastructure work. So we created a position that solely focused on policy and youth development within the city. And finally, we did some programmatic work as well, which um, I guess what I would call the signature one is free, fair free transit for all youth all the time, any day, any hour, any month of the year um, for young people in Sacramento County. So just remember that there are a lot of other things we can do. We don't have to just wait for each election to work on a revenue measure, which as Margaret said, is one of the most important things we could be doing to support children and youth. So let me share um, a couple of lessons. So the first thing that we figured out minute, after reflecting back is that um, compromise is going to be the word of the day. And what I mean by that is the first time we went to the ballot, it was solely led by um, the council member, and he was the champion, and he really um, went out and raised all the money and set the tone for the campaign. The second time was purely community-led um, effort. They gathered signatures, a bunch of CBOs worked together to get it on the ballot. It was amazing the work that was done and a uh, council member also supported that work and it, it didn't pass. So this last time, finally we got together with the council member and the community leaders um, the community-based organizations that had led that second. And we came together and we built a coalition and worked to get this passed. Now, I say that what we did is we found our magic recipe. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share that recipe with you because I truly believe each place is gonna have a different recipe, um, but there is a magic recipe out there and, and you will find it, I know you will. The second thing that I wanted to share is the leadership role that young people played in our campaign was outstanding. And it really started, we had young people who started with us in 2016 and continued through all three campaigns. And the signature gathering, as hard as it is, really galvanized a core of young people to stick to it and keep going until we won. Um, now, given uh, my age, which I will not tell you what it is, I was so thankful that they were involved because the social media campaign that they led was phenomenal. And you can find it online. Um, it's look for Yes on Measure L or Sat Kids First. There's some great TikTok videos and things like that. I am so grateful to them um, for not only doing that, but they were out every single weekend knocking on doors and no adult can say no to a kid. So no doors were slammed in their faces. And I always made sure that I took a young person with me <laughs> when I went canvassing. So we had a chance to speak to each voter. The last thing I wanted to share, and I alluded to this a little bit, is that context matters, circumstances matter. And what I mean by that is kind of the unique situations that happen with each campaign to Sacramento led to the outcomes. In this last case, there are two things that I actually think all of us could be doing um, to understand better the chances of winning. So first is looking at what else is gonna be on the ballot. In Sacramento, some of you may have heard about a measure called Measure O, which was around homelessness. Homelessness is a big issue across the state. In Sacramento, it's been top of mind. This effort was led by the business community and they got it onto the ballot. And what ended up happening is it sucked up all the money that we would have been able to fundraise for the children's fund. And it was really challenging to raise money. And I think if we had realized that this was actually gonna get on the ballot earlier, we would have started fundraising earlier and we would have had an easier time. We really went to the last minute to try to raise our campaign budget. So paying attention to what else is on the ballot and what kind of effect it may have on your ability to fundraise and to get you know, airtime about your, your ballot measure. The second thing that is about context, and um, 
I'm going to give Dave Metz a lot of credit for this, is what is public opinion around taxes in particular? And in Sacramento, what we knew from polling is that folks are not exactly loving government these days and not exactly wanting to be taxed. So as part of our message out, as part of our campaign message was, this will not raise your taxes. So we played against what we knew public sentiment was to promote the Children's Fund by also saying this will not raise your taxes. And I think that resonated with a lot of people. So those are the three things that I can share with you right now that I hope start telling you our story. I'm happy for anybody to reach out to me anytime and talk to you longer and, about it. And I, I want to say Claudia is a major resource to this effort, to, to you um, she has learned more in three campaigns <laughs> than most people can learn from this work. And so this is the kind of thing we want to accomplish through this effort, where people are sharing their stories, sharing their lessons, and creating a group where that can happen. So um, Claudia and I have been through the wars on this for many, many years, and uh, I can guarantee she's a great resource. So what I was hoping to do, and this could be a nightmare, but I'm hoping, because I want to give you a feeling of who's out there and um, give at least some of you, as many as we have some reasonable amount of time to do um, just a sentence about what community um, and I'm interested in people hearing about a community, <laughs> you know, so one person from each community. I, I have a list here. I think I've sort of figured out a lot of the people who are here. So um, if we could start with San Diego and have Courtney just be a model for one minute. No big deal. Hi, all. Courtney Baltiski, she, her pronouns. Um, I am with the YMCA of San Diego County. I'm our vice president of public policy and advocacy. As part of that work, um, I helped found and now co-facilitate what we call the Children First Collective. Check us out online and social media. We have some amazing parent advocates now uh, compensated to run our media. So give us a follow. Uh, San Diego is definitely at a place where we're cultivating more champions and interest around the issues pertaining to children and youth. Uh, we have three out of five uh, supervisors on our board of supervisors engaged in a number of initiatives as well as uh, city council members and the mayor of San Diego. We've established uh, local infrastructure dedicated to children, youth and their families in the city of San Diego's Office of Child and Youth Success. We passed a measure in November. Uh, and that's, it is a it's a charter amendment um, that expands access to child care. It passed at 67%, so we're primed to do more work there. Uh, we're drafting a county blueprint for child care. We have a youth opportunity pass for transit. So a lot of the things that Claudia and we are taking off in hopes of pursuit of local dedicated funding. In 2024, maybe, at either the city or county level. Um, Elliot, you want to tell us what's happening, where you're at in Fresno? Oh, um, I guess what I, do you want me to share about Measure P from 20? No, I want to share you to share where you're at in terms of putting a measure on the ballot in 2024. And it's, I okay, it's okay to say we, we, we're interested, but we have no idea yet. <laughs> yeah, we, we're the backbone for the uh, Fresno Drive Collective Impact Initiative, which has identified some pretty big deficits in our early care um systems, public systems, but we're not at a point where we've got the sense together with our partners of that, that this is going to be core to the solution of those challenges just yet. Great. And Elliot works for the Community Foundation in the Valley and um, is a member of the coalition that aspires to get a measure on the ballot, maybe 2024, maybe, maybe later. Um, uh, Melinda or Michelle from Santa Barbara. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Michelle Robertson. I'm the assistant director of First Five Santa Barbara County and Melinda's vice president of United Way of Santa Barbara County. And um, we are kind of building off of the ARPA um, commitment that our local board of supervisors um, put some funds towards to get us going. And then really thinking forward about the sustainability of that work uh, throughout 
a ballot measure. And Melinda, share anything more you'd like to. Okay. Um, so we have people who have done, you know, years of work like San Diego and people who are just starting to think about a ballot measure and people like Elliot who've worked on other ballot measures but are considering um, a, a local ballot measure for uh, just kids. So someone from Jose or Monique from Delano. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose Oriana. I'm the co-executive director of Loud for Tomorrow in Kern County. Um, and we are interested in seeing uh, uh, if it's feasible to do something city or countywide for youth investments here in, Cal in the Central Valley. We have a lot of, um, a lot of conservative um, electives who continue to push back on investing in young people and we're really tired we're really we want to see action at the city and county level for investment so really excited for this for this opportunity and to learn from all um the amazing people in this room thank you claudia it was a really good presentation i got some motivation great um someone from santa maria either rebecca or yvette or gloria <laughs> sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is um, Gloria Soto, and um, I'm here representing Future Leaders of America as its executive director with some of my colleagues. We span from Ventura County all the way to Santa Barbara County, and um, we are eyeing um, the possibility of starting um, some ballot, a, a ballot initiative. So we're trying to figure out what we want to do. Um, we're considering local um, ballot initiatives for um, supporting youth and families, um, but we're also contemplating a statewide ballot initiative. Um, so Claudia, amazing presentation. I agree with um, Jose. Um, I took lots of notes, um, but we may be reaching out to you at some time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're we're gonna have a host of people that are available to 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 you. So Marin, Pega, or Michelle, or somebody else from Marin. Hi there, uh, David. Hey. David, did you want to speak for us? Or would you like me to go ahead? You should, why don't you go ahead? So okay. we. Can, uh, well, hi everyone. I'm first uh, Michelle Fidelli at First Five Marin Children and Families Commission, and our commissioner David Bonfilio is uh, on the line with us as well as. Uh, Leslie Weber from our um, new county supervisor. And I think the the three of us were involved in our original um, ballot measure, unfortunate ballot measure back in 2016, which like others suffered from being on the Hillary uh, Trump ballot because right at the end, as others were saying, we lost funding steam and effort because all focus you know, went, went elsewhere. Um, but I'm encouraged by hearing that, you know, three times a charm and that it's worth trying again. <laughs> we only lost by 2,500 votes and there was a weird, some weird late um, local opposition based on a rumor that we didn't have any money or ability to combat. So um, I'm definitely interested in trying again. I just wanted to mention one thing in, we originally tried to get on the ballot in 2014 and were asked by county supervisors to delay because they had another funding measure on and surveys showed that both wouldn't be successful. So we waited and that put us on with Hillary and Trump. Um, had, had we been successful in 2016, we were estimated to earn $12 million a year. We would have earned $72 million by now. That's heartbreaking to me. And I really don't know why um, there wasn't a, a second effort very soon. I think people got exhausted by everything. Um, so hopefully it's time to be successful. And they learned a lot, those of that first time. Oh, oh we learned there. a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go on to Oakland. Frankie, is Frankie here? Somebody from the Oakland effort? Hi, everyone. My name is Frankie Ramos. Um, I'm Director of Campaigns and Organizing at Courage. We're a nonprofit in Oakland. Um, 
Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice. We're thinking about um, going for a county ballot measure in actually 2026, um, because our county is pretty big and we think we've got a lot of support in some pockets and we'll really have to build support in other pockets. And that's it. But, and what they're doing, if you don't mind, they wanna move money out of the justice system into the uh, positive youth community investment system. So that is uh, a, a way to go about this and one way you can use the ballot. So um, we're real excited about what could go on in Alameda yeah. County. Um, Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. So San Luis Obispo, Shauna or Rochelle? Shauna, Rochelle. Hi, I'll speak. I'm Shana Paulson. I'm with the Community Action Partnership of San Luis Obispo. Um, specifically representing our resource and referral and alternative payment program here alongside our child care planning council coordinator, Rochelle Bollet. We're in the, not the very initial stages because Margaret, we were fortunate to have you come to our county many years ago and we're excited then and have been working in different directions since that time. But we're recognizing that we have a need and we want to find out more. We too have benefited from some local and federal and state investments and are wondering how to make this sustainable. We feel like we have the ear of our local leaders um, that our community understands the important role early care and education plays. Um, and so the piece that we know we'll be missing very soon is the funding to continue to operate at this high level, um, recruiting and creating options and access for families. That would be great. Calexico, um, Dylan or Danielle, D Dylan. Hello. Hey everyone, I'm happy to jump in here. Yeah. Um, very great to be here this afternoon. Um, so uh, I'm, my name is Daniela Flores. I'm a, stepping into the role of executive organizer for Imperial Valley Equity and Justice Coalition. Um, just very briefly, we are advocates for uh, health equity, environmental justice, and social justice. So. Um, you know, we formed amid the pandemic uh, because of, of 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 all the things that that we all know in this space of of the injustice. And um, one of our biggest efforts in the last year was around ARPA. So similar to another folk, um, like we're building upon uh, pretty much. Uh, you know, making different priorities when investing in uh, with community dollar or public dollars, and um, we're able to get some wins um, in for equity. And so we're really looking to. Um, we've had some really difficult um, things happening with teachers um, and and their contracts. So the students have been part of a movement really to in solidarity with teachers for many years. And so we feel like there's a lot of movement happening um, and we have a lot of partnerships with them um, informally and look to really start to formalize. So we're on the very early stages of this, um, but we definitely have um, you know, our coalition as indiv uh, as individuals have worked to um, make the, the Calexico City Council more progressive. Um, and we think that Calexico, we, we would probably be ready to use some of the cannabis uh, tax money where um, it's actually, there's a lot of corruption in Calexico. It was deemed high risk. So um, right now that we have a city manager that's pretty much uncovering all of the things that are um, in that part of that corruption. And we think that this really very soon is gonna be a good moment to take uh, into that opportunity to um, to take advantage of that for youth and um, a lot more to learn about what we would do with that money. But um, I really inspired by everything here. Countywide, it's, it's such a dream. I think we're probably looking more like 2026 20, but i'd like to like vet this with our organizers we're like very early in the stages and um just have a lot of work to do uh just hearing everyone here and i'm really excited to to be part of this coalition and um just turn translating a youth movement on like education issues or other issues into a ballot measure is such an exciting journey and such an exciting opportunity. And there are a number of people on this call who are doing that. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give a few more people recognizing not every place will get um, uh, a chance because we wanna do a few other things in this meeting. So Ventura, Jack. Thank you, Margaret, and hello, everyone. I'm Jack Hinojosa. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Child Development Resources. 
Uh, we provide Head Start, Early Head Start, State Preschool, and uh, subsidized child care and resource and referral agency for our county. I'm part of an initiative that's uh, led by the Ventura County Community Foundation. Uh, it's uh, referred to as the Isabella Project. And the goal is to try to serve all four-year-olds and three-year-olds in the city of Santa Paula. We, uh, we formed a, a rather large group that's uh, been in the planning stages for about a year now. Uh, right around the same time that the governor invested in transitional kindergarten. And what we're looking at is uh, wraparound services for all children, three and four year olds in Santa Paula as a pilot. Uh, so we're, I'm here today for exploration to hear and learn from others and uh, glad to be here today. Great. Um, and uh, Inland, you, Brian from Inland Empire, you wanna do like 30 seconds? Absolutely. So uh, my name is Brian. I'm our public policy and technology manager with the Inland Empire Community Collaborative. Um, I have here Claudia Montoya with me. Um, we are our nonprofit is basically a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits build their own capacity in the region. Uh, one of the big projects that we're working on is the IE Children's Cabinet. Um, which has been a really great success for us. So we have a lot of stakeholders in the region who are working together to push forward for policy at the state level and at the local level. Um, so we've we've had a lot of wins under our belt within the last couple of years that we've been active. Um, and with the help with of Margaret uh, and others, we, we're, we're really looking forward to uh, get some ballot initiatives under our belt soon, uh, 2024, 2026, right? Like that's that's something we want to look forward to. Um, I'm gonna. <laughs> so I, I'm cutting off the people I know best because they, know <laughs> they won't hate me. <laughs> so just, no just know that. Um, uh, Tim from Lompoc, somebody, somebody from Lompoc is here. L L Hello. Um, I don't oh, know if Tim's on. Uh, this is Chuck Madsen uh, oh, from Chuck, Lompoc. Yes. Yeah. Uh, future for Lompoc youth. Uh, I'm very interested. I, I don't think we have an exact plan in place yet. Thank you, Claudia, for sharing. Um, our, our youth in Lompoc are, de are definitely in need as uh, we can't seem to get a bond measure passed for our schools uh, since they have been built in 1960. Uh, we just missed it by a 0.5% last time during elections. Um, and being the highest concentration of cannabis industry in per population in California, I think there's a great opportunity to uh, measure those tax dollars uh, and support our youth. Um, so I'm really interested and look forward to uh, what we can do here in our community. Thank you for having me on. Oh, so I wanted to ask Gabriella from Los Angeles to uh, maybe introduce herself. Are you on? You were there earlier, Gabriella. Okay. Um, is there anybody from a different city? And let's set aside Los Angeles because it's sort of its own world and it's complicated um, uh, that would like to sort of share a minute of what city or county they're, they're trying to get a measure for. Did I, did I hit almost everyone? Uh, this is Susie. Um, I'm Susie Marone with uh, Child Care Planning Council in Sonoma County. And we've been trying to do something like this for many, many years. Um, the closest I think we got to um, was last year. We have a local initiative, um, Our Kids, Our Future, trying to get something on the ballot. Um, ran into a hiccup here and there. And so... We were hoping to be on the ballot last fall. Now we're planning for um, 2024. And again, it would be um, just local quarter sales, um, sales tax and hoping to generate 22 million. Um, but we're kind of like starting over here again. No, you're not. That is the like point <laughs> I was going to say. We're, right, we're going from Sonoma, which actually was ready to put my measure on the ballot, developed the coalition, wrote the measure, you know, it, it got it all through all the uh, political channels and then ran into a rough spot um, about signature gathering. So to people- Lesson who, learned. <laughs> people who are, and we'll, we'll do a whole training on signature gathering because it's a, 
It's a very important part of this. What I am going to do now, and apologies to people who didn't get to introduce their place, but I wanted to give you a feeling for who's in the room and who's potentially in the network. Um, I'm going to um, just give you a five minute uh, story of my life. Um, let's see, how do we do a slideshow uh, from beginning? I already did that. Um, so uh, I'll give you a few, a little bit more for the new people in the room of sort of the basics of what we're talking about. So the roadmap for doing this, and I say it takes anywhere from two to, and I said six years to sort of develop a measure, get it on the ballot, depends on where you're starting. In Sonoma, they could do it tomorrow. Um, some other places, they're thinking maybe 2026. But basically, it's not rocket science, it's just hard. Um, and it's all things people online know about. And there's, it, it, there's, it's not a linear process. You're making the case, you're building the base of support and making the case also includes not just the research, know what the needs are, but communicating the case, building the base. Then you have to develop a proposal, which is an art and a science unto itself. And then you mount the campaign. So those are the sort of four elements of the work. And I have these crazy signs because to show you you, there's no uh, direct line to doing this. What I feel from what I've seen, what needs to be in place, I'm going to send out these slides. Don't take notes. You don't have to memorize it. Just get a feeling for what I'm talking about. You have to have an organization that's convening this. You have to have a coalition that has some diversity. Yeah, you have to have baseline information in order to move forward, an agreement about what to fund. That's easier said than done. You have to have the motivation or already done, you know, so organizing of the base. Um, and you have to have some money to provide some staff support for this. This cannot be done just we're going to meet once a month and volunteers will do it. If you have a political champion on your city council, on your board of supervisors, um, that is helpful, very helpful, but not necessary. And I wrote last the passion and willingness to take risks. And my experience is the people who sort of fall by the side on this are the people who just are, you know, it, 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 the feeling about getting it done isn't, isn't really strong enough. The people who just are so passionate about it ultimately get it done. So what you're gonna be doing now and some people have already done it or way down the line, you're gonna be assessing the feasibility of doing a measure in, in your city or county. And I say it's an art, not a science. I made a list here of things you wanna assess, which are obvious, but this is time consuming. This is like, you wanna know what your revenue options are. You wanna know what the legal constraints are. You wanna know what the history of ballot measures are. You wanna know what your political leaders and what leaders in the community think about this. You may wanna do a poll and find out you know, more about public opinion. And you're considering who your partners are, what the opposition is, can you overcome it, what your greatest assets are. So you, you're going through an assessment process. So just by the way, and we will do a couple of trainings on this. These are the possibilities for money. These are the taxes you can pass at a local level. Most people have done sales taxes or parcel taxes or cannabis taxes, or you can do what they might do in Alameda County and other places in which a lot of the, the children's funds we have in, um, in the state have done what's called a set aside, put on the ballot, like we're gonna set aside X percent of the general fund for a youth fund. And we can talk about where you can do this and how it can be done. Um, generally speaking, it's you, when you do that, um, uh, uh, you probably need to collect, collect signatures because your city council or board of supervisors generally don't like to pass measures like that. Um, hmm. I'm just sorry about that, guys. Uh, so I'm sending this out. Um, we have lots of information about what different revenue possibilities there are. I did for an earlier meeting, a timeline. So if you're starting now, here are the different things you want to go through and the kind of timeline that you'll, you'll be looking at. So between now and July, you're making the case, you're researching, um, 
in, in July, if you want to put it on the ballot yourself, you're all probably already getting ready to develop your proposal, draft your measure, hire a lawyer. Um, and then in the fall, you're going to want to submit signatures and then uh, you want to launch your campaign in June. So this is just, this isn't a rigid timeline, but it can give you a feeling for what's involved here. If you can get your city council or board of supervisors to put this measure on the ballot themselves, you can, you don't have to go through all the signature gathering and you can, this, these are, these are the young people in Sacramento submitting the signatures. You don't have to do it uh, if you have a city council or board of supervisors who will do it. So these are the kinds of things that we are offering training, support, consultation on in groups, uh, individually, or with a group from your community, or all of the above. Um, I want you to know where we've become a one-stop shop for people, helping people figure out from where they're at to, um, you know, to figure out how to get to, to, to get to a winning campaign, actually. So what I want to do now is stop and just introduce you to a few of the other people who are part of the network that we've set up, um, not by no means not the only people, and you've already met Claudia, um, who are who have been very helpful to the various campaigns around the state. And I first, so I'm introducing you to three people. I'm like speeding right along here. I'm hoping this is making sense to people. Um, so let me first, and I'm giving them all just a very short amount of time to say what they do and what they can offer in terms of their services to you. So let me start with Jessica Lovejoy, who um, works with 50 plus one strategies and her um, the, the principal at 50 plus one strategy, strategies is Nicole Durst, who many of the people on the line know, um, but has had just had a baby. So Jessica is here to represent her, but Nicole will be back to um, do the actual training and support for people. Jessica. Thanks so much, Mark. <laughs> Thanks so much, Margaret. Um, yes, my name is Jessica Lovejoy and I'm Vice President of Campaigns with 50 Plus One. My background is in organizing and in campaign management. And for the past 10 years, I've had the opportunity of both knowing Margaret and working very closely with uh, Nicole, uh, who you may be familiar with. Uh, she's out on maternity leave, uh, but she'll be back soon. So I'll be stepping in to support you all in the time being. And so just a bit about what we do at 50 plus one and, and who we are. So we are a premier consulting firm that operates at the local state and national levels to elect democratic candidates, advance movement building issues at the ballot box and support causes that create positive change. We do this with um, committees and entities from uh, start the beginning of a campaign from its inception to execution and implementation. And we've worked with ballot measure committees and children's run uh, organizations for many, many years now. We have more than a century's worth of experience working on campaigns and our team is 60% women and 60% people of color. We're made up of diverse professionals and we have demonstrated success both in the public and private and non nonprofit sectors. I think that's one of our greatest uh, advantages which you have now at your fingertips. Um, our level of expertise from strategic comms to digital organizing, to paid media campaigns, to legal advice, even if you need it. And so, they have been, uh, yeah, go on, one minute. Uh, great, I'll just wrap it up here by saying, we work closely with Margaret, uh, training over 400 child advocates over the last several years. We lead trainings uh, with community leaders all across the state on campaign strategy, message development, grassroots organizing, budgeting, earned media, and more, and we also provide that one-on-one -on -one coaching. So what that means is that anything from like drafting your measure to creating your campaign plan, building the coalition, managing the coalition, organizing a field campaign, developing a paid media campaign, we're gonna be there to help support you. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you to Margaret, um, but look forward to seeing everyone at upcoming cohort meetings and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or wanna chat individually or as a group. 
they have been fabulous and everybody has loved them and they have been so generous with their time and the level of expertise. It, it's been exciting to have a premier political consulting firm as our partner in this. Um, Dave Metz, are you there? Uh, Dave Metz is nationally, national, one of the premier national pollsters, uh, state, local, and has been our partner in this since day one, Dave, uh, and has become, Dave does everything. Uh, he is the president of um, uh, FM3 polling uh, uh, st strategy, because uh, they go way beyond polling. Um, and uh, yeah. He has been beyond generous to this group and will be doing a poll for us in uh, March to actually give you a lot of good information about different parts of the state and what the public opinion is of funding for kids. Dave. All right. Thank you, Margaret. And thanks to all of you for the chance to be here today. So I'm Dave Metz. I'm the president of FM3 Research. I'm joined by my colleague, Lucia Del Pupo, who's a senior VP with the firm, and the two of us have been working with Margaret, um, also with the Children's Funding Project uh, nationally over the course of the last decade or so um, to help provide research to inform the kinds of campaigns that uh, you all are, are launching. Um, for those of you who haven't worked with a pollster before, essentially, um, we conduct surveys of voters. We do focus groups, small uh, uh, group discussions that are sort of more open-ended and, and qualitative research to understand why people think what they think, and a range of other research services. And when it comes to campaigns to fund children and youth, there's basically four things that you get out of doing a poll. Um, the first is just understanding the feasibility of your ballot measure concept. Is this something that the public is likely to support in enough numbers to make it look like you can be successful? Uh, both in terms of the initial support voters offer, and then after you go through some of the pros and cons that they might hear over the course of the campaign, does that shift in a way that that you can sort of see a path to, to victory? Um, secondly, a poll can help you with the design of your measure. Um, you face lots of different choices in terms of how you structure, how you raise money, how you spend money, how you govern and oversee how the, the money is used. And the public may have uh, strong opinions on some of those options. There may be things that they're more enthusiastic about, things that they're less enthusiastic about. There may be other times where it doesn't really matter to them. They kind of uh, greet the choice with a shrug. Um, either way, public opinion can be one important uh, uh, input into deciding how to structure a measure. Not the only one. Obviously, good public policy is the first thing that's going to guide you. Um, but to win a campaign, obviously, there's a balancing act that you have to strike here. Um, third, the polling can help you in fundraising and coalition building. Um, it's important to tell yourself and your allies whether you can get this done and, and how you can design a measure to be successful. But ultimately, you're going to need to convince donors, endorsers, coalition partners of the, the same aspects of the measure's viability. And many of them will say, well, do you have polling? Do you have some objective scientific research that shows that you've got a path to victory here? Um, and Polling can provide that. We're, we're sort of uh, uh, used to writing very short memos that basically say, yes, we can win, and, and here's how <laughs> we can do it. And then finally, the fourth and most important thing that the polling does for you is help to, to plan your campaign and shape your strategy. Um, all of the sort of work that Jessica just described that she and her colleagues at 50 Plus One do um, is based on what the polling tells us is the likeliest path to success. Um, the polling tells you which voters you need to target, what it is you need to tell them, the best ways of reaching them, and the best messengers to use in communicating those messengers to them. Um, any campaign is all about allocating scarce resources to make sure that you're spending every nickel in a way that is going to do the most to maximize your chances of success. And the polling really provides the roadmap, the game plan to guide you to that most effective allocation of resources. Um, so typically, the polling that we'll do for, for local campaigns is usually a survey of 400 voters, somewhere between 15, 20 minutes in length, combination of phone and online interviews in multiple languages, if that's appropriate to the jurisdiction. Um, there's a range of other research services that campaigns may use if they've got additional budget and, and needs, but that's kind of the core uh, product that, that most campaigns use on the polling side.
But Dave, you know, we I need to be brief. To make, so I wanted uh, to make sure people under because people asked about communication strategies and how to you know what what to say to conservative audiences, et cetera, et cetera. And Dave has done a number of trainings on that for our people. You know, sort of what kind of messaging will work. You learn that from polling, and so that's been an important part of his contribution, by the way. So our last person on this team that I am going to introduce to you, although we have. Uh, other people, lawyers, et cetera, um, is Ed Harrington, <laughs> who goes way back on this and is our public finance expert and who has been the controller of San Francisco for 17 years and is a nationally recognized expert in public finance and was the controller when we first passed our children's fund. And so he had to figure out how to deal with it. So Ed, and has helped, I think we've helped now 22 places analyze their budgets. A lot. <laughs> A lot. I, <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. I, I counted 22. <laughs> so, so yeah, when we say we want more services for kids, then we say we actually want more money to provide those services. And then people say, well, how much do we spend now? And all those kind of roads lead towards having some understanding of your local budget situation. And budgets are not particularly friendly, welcoming documents for most people. And so the part that I play often is to come in and say, I try to demystify the budget. You know, how big is it? Where does the money come from? How does it get spent? So you start to get an idea of what's going on there. Um, it, it, it ends up often making sure that when you then go start to talk to people, you don't sound like you're just kind of wandering off the street. You sound like you actually have done some research. You know what's going on. You can say, gee, this is what I understand is important. This is what's not important. It also helps you realize, you know, what are the big revenue sources? Because when you start trying to figure out where you're going to raise money, it makes sense to raise money where the money is, as opposed to saying, oh, I'm going to do you know, a hotel tax when there's only two hotels in your, in your, in your city. So it, we can work on those kind of things to make sure that you have an understanding of revenue and where the money is being spent. To some extent, we try to figure out is money being spent now directly on youth services, which is really hard on most of your budgets. Most of your budgets don't show that kind of information. But you can see, you know, rec park, libraries. If you're in a county, you can see it's juvenile probation. That's where the money is going. That's locally generated for children is going into incarceration. Isn't that wonderful? So you'll be, so be able to find those things and help you kind of understand what's going on there. The other part that we do is you then have to really, you're already doing it in many cases, but you have got to talk to your local elected and appointed officials. And since I was one of those kind of people, I can help you figure out how you can talk to them, what they will say back to you and how you can counteract that kind of a discussion to move it forward. So it's, it's generally in the budget area, but also in working with local elected officials and appointed officials. And it's kind of fun to do. And I think I have done probably 20 or 30 budgets for counties in California doing this kind of review of them already. So it's familiar. <laughs> and people have loved getting support from him. Claudia, did it help you? What? Yes, I mean, tremendously helpful. All the experts have helped Sacramento in one way or another. The, the group that's not represented is the law firm that you work with. They've given some really intense and helpful um, legal advice. And Margaret, this is not necessarily an expert, but I just wanted to share with the group something else that really benefited me and my colleagues in terms of our efforts was being part of a cohort and a learning community. First of all, of course, support, like just emotional support as you're slogging through six years of trying to get this passed. Um, but also we shared documents, we shared ideas, we share, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. As my, Margaret said, it's not rocket science. Um, and usually every single time we had a conversation, someone would say, oh, I have done that. Let me get you that document. So that just, uh, you know, that just was great peer support, peer coaching and, and things like that. And then lastly, again, Margaret has undersold herself in terms of what she can provide as an expert. I'll speak to my experience. I talked to y'all about this magic recipe and how unique it is to each city. That's what Margaret would do for me. I'd call up and say, here's what's happening in Sacramento. And you know, she would, her encyclopedia of knowledge would pull together um, 
giving me ideas for very tailored to Sacramento. So I appreciate that about Margaret's individual support as well. So it's the experts, this cohort learning community that you, you get and working with funding the next generation. And of course, Margaret's expertise. Wow, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> was, um, so I would like everybody to write into the chat. Do you want to be part of this? And so the next stage for us and we have two more minutes, is, is that we're gonna be following up with everyone. I'm gonna send you a survey. Uh, Claudia is going to help me and we're going to do follow-up phone calls, follow-up ever so we can develop the next phase of this work, what the next learning communities need to be about, how often we need to have them, what individual uh, places need specifically right now. So I'm, I'm hoping that you get a feeling for what this is about. And then um, it, within the, over the next month, we'll be figuring out how to, uh, how to structure this in a way specific to meet your needs. So um, I think that it's 12.58. It just felt like a race. Um, any, so I'm getting a lot of yeses and, uh, I, I really hope it would be so exciting for this state to have this many wonderful and diverse people actually using the ballot to get money for kids. So I am going to share my screen and put up my contact information. Um, and um, I, and um, so I hope everyone uh, has, let's see, has, yes, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and I look forward to talking to every single, people from every single community that has uh, been to this meeting and wants to move forward with this. Thank you.